every year GRCC's visual arts faculty has hosted a panel discussion featuring some of the artists whose work are on display here at the college. Even more importantly, every year GRCC arts faculty have had their work showcased in Art Prize. This year, we proudly continue all of those traditions. And I especially encourage you to make sure that you see the wonderful pieces that we have in our Collins Art Gallery on the fourth floor of the main building and right here in the Spectrum Theater Lobby. I encourage you to venture farther afield as well and make sure that you see the following pieces done by our full-time art faculty. Daily Sublimations, a painting by Katie Budden that is at the Fifth Third Bank, Werner Norcross Judd site. Tour Bus to Athens 2009, a painting by Nick Antonakis that is at Cathedral Square. And Teapot 48, a sculpture by Scott Gerard at Cathedral Square. Yeah, <laughs> clap. <laughs> If you are an arts enthusiast, and I see we have them in the audience, um, you have undoubtedly seen the work of our faculty, those just mentioned, and others like Filippo Tagliati and Robin Van Royen and others. Their work is displayed locally, nationally, even internationally. Yes, their work has made it around the world. And I hope that you have enjoyed um, viewing their work as much as I have and as much as people far more learned in the arts have. In fact, I am very, very grateful to all of the GRCC visual arts faculty, and I'm going to ask them to stand up and be recognized here tonight. So GRCC faculty, I know you're here, so please stand and let us acknowledge you. <laughs> they are, as you no accomplished artists themselves, but maybe even more significantly, they are accomplished teachers of artists. And they take great delight, as do I, in the many achievements that our students have in the visual arts here at GRCC. In fact, we are delighted that many of them continue their education at Kendall College of Art and Design. Um, and all of our panelists tonight are associated with that wonderful institution, and so we're glad they're here. Again, I thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Hello, I am Nick Antonakis, uh, Department Head of Visual Arts, and first of all, I wanna thank uh, Dean Chesley for that wonderful introduction. And then welcome all of you to our Spectrum Theater and to this event that we've held for five years in a row. Uh, we have really enjoyed this event every year and I'm very happy to have uh, the three artists to my left who are part of our panel tonight and I have a short introduction of each one of them uh, coming up so I wanna let you know who they are before they start presenting their work to you. Uh, before I forget it though, I also wanna invite you to a a uh, small reception after this event uh, in the lobby of our theater, theater, where we also have other artists being displayed. Uh, we have two venues on our campus, uh, and that is uh, the theater lobby here of the Spectrum Theater and the Collins Art Gallery that has been mentioned, where these three artists to my left are exhibiting currently. So I hope that you'll make it to the gallery also to actually enjoy the work live. Uh, because, as you know, it looks a lot better in real life than even in slides. But tonight, we'll have the slides in front of us. So, uh, without further ado, I will start with the introductions. Directly to my left, uh, we have Diana Slattery. And he has several degrees, a BBA, a BFA, an MA, and an MFA. I got this from the website, so I hope that it is all correct. Um, and he has 40 years of teaching experience. He's a professor at Kendall College of Art and Design. Viana's work has been exhibited uh, in numerous competitive exhibitions and has been displayed or is in collections in 35 of our states. Then directly to the left of Viana is Megan, Megan Kelso. 
And she received her BFA from Truman State University in Missouri and her MFA, Master of Fine Arts degree, from Kendall College of Art and Design. Uh, her paintings address the impact of place and she aims to create spaces resonant with tension between what is ordered and disordered. I copied and pasted some of that and I was very interested in it, so that's what I chose, Megan, <laughs> for your introduction. I hope you'll be able to enlighten us about uh, those aspects. Uh, and to uh, the left of Megan, we have Alina Poroshina. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Oh, thank you. And uh, she was born in Moscow, Russia, Russia, and she emigrated to the United States as a young, uh, at a young age with a refugee status. This transition, transition had a profound influence on her as an individual and as an artist. In 2007, she earned a Master of Fine Arts degree in studio art from Kendall College of Art and Design. She has exhibited her works in Chicago Gallery 180 and numerous other venues across the Midwest and the New York area. So please, let's have a nice uh, hand for the artists uh, who are here to welcome them. And uh, I'm not exactly sure if we're gonna start with Viana, but uh, if you feel like you should be the first artist, uh, we're ready. Okay, that All works right. for me. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks to Nick and uh, GRCC for the lovely uh, gallery space. And uh, I think Jordan helped me and thanks to my daughter, Caitlin, as we constructed this uh, leaning tower. Uh, it's meant to lean, if you've seen it. Um, um, I'm gonna have you just click through the four images and I'm gonna just have people look at them visually first. And then I'm gonna hold the last one of the sculpture. This one's cropped slightly, and I just found that out. And it looks like it might be even wrong in the book, so we'll see what happens. And this is also cropped a little bit too, but we, we can get a feel for what I'm looking at and what you're looking at. And here's the piece uh, temporarily set up uh, in the Kendall uh, Atrium Gallery area. Uh, I could talk about the formal aspects, and we're going to watch here first, but that gets a little boring. Uh, but, I, but there are a couple of fascinating things. No, nothing's glued together, nothing's tied together, nothing's fastened together. Uh, essentially, uh, they interlock and just gravity holds them together. Uh, I think what's kind of fascinating to me is that um, I started with wood, which is a tree, of course. And if you, if you study the piece, it starts to twist and lean like a tree. So, you know, it's, it's not too likely that we would see it as a tree. But when I say that, you know, some things are revealed a little bit. Um, I don't know if anybody looked carefully enough, but there's a, there's a little shelf with some rocks inside uh, on each shelf. And then there's a butternut a wood carved uh, piece in from India. Um, very elaborate, uh, done by 13-year-olds uh, typically in the streets of India. So it's that part's, uh, you know, um, come across the ocean, so to speak. So there's a different type of energy than my energy there, but then I synthesize that. Then it all kind of emerges out of a mandala. So if you have some kind of sense of symbolic meaning, um, you know, that, that has uh, all kinds of repercussions, so to speak. Um, but it's really, what do I do? Um, I, I, st I start with ideas. I start with uh, absurd combinations of words. And I say, well, there's no way I can make an image out of that. And which is, you know, kind of fascinating. So I, you know, I, I make lists of words and then, I, then diagrams appear and then uh, I draw 10 minutes and I lie down 20 minutes and you know, it's kind of an ongoing contemplative process of, of it's self-revelation, but it isn't self-centered. It seems to be a, 
something that connects me to a greater whole. Um, I would say the second I realized that this was my path uh, as an artist, uh, I guess you could say I, I examine layers of reality, which sounds a little heady. I was gonna start my little comments on transformations of conscious, and I said, well, everybody's gonna go home, so we'll leave that alone. Uh, but it, I think it visually, if we see an onion and we understand that there's, as I peel those layers, and that's an old cliche, so that I'm not gonna say anything especially revolutionary, uh, you know, we see deeper layers of ourselves. Um, and I think it's this deeper layering that allows me to be vital and healthy and uh, compassionate. Um, and it seems like that would be my priority, but ironically, there's two priorities. The deeper me connects to the other. So that person or the, that tree, for that matter, is my priority. So, you know, that doesn't bother me. The logic doesn't bother me at that. There's two priorities. If I don't do one, I can't do the other. So after not working for a few days, uh, you know, there's a little itch and something has to happen again. So um, I think artists are obsessive, but, you know, I'm, I'm some obsessive personality, but I don't think my art is done obsessively. Uh, I don't, th I can take a day off without any guilt. Anyways, let's move on here. What What's interesting maybe is I like to play the game of association, so we're not gonna have a you know a throw back and forth kind of thing here, but already the tree is here. But maybe you can think of some associations or imagine some associations of what what is this that I've got? Where did it come from? In, in fact, it's rather easy to see when I show the next image, which you, which you already saw. Um, it's really the gesture of a human figure coming out of this circular mandala, like throwing a rock. It merges or diving in and the water comes up and it splashes these waves. It connects with the shoreline and it kind of feed back, feeds back on itself. So we'll go to the next slide, please, or image. And you can see the there's a, quite a literal formal connection between, I, I realize there's a little delay, the formal connection between what you're gonna see, but now we're looking for the figure dancing around this, you know, gotta go. One more. Okay, now, everybody can see the correspondence is very literal. Well, that's probably not too surprising either. Uh, I mean, I haven't said anything of, you know, great purport at this point. But you look at, she's dancing around the circle, her body gesture is almost identical to this abstract kind of configuration here. Um, she's loose and kind of unattached, so to speak, as dancers would be. And of course, the sculpture is too. Nothing fits together. And every time it comes down, it's reassembled in another way. And I think that's the spirit of dance. And I think um, spirit, it kind of gets a little spooky to me, kind of sounds phantom-like. So I like, I like to say, um, be spirited like a child spirited. And, and don't we all love that? Don't we all love that when we see the, this apparently unlimited energy in a child and it seems to go on and on and on. So to me, uh, the dance and, and song, the rhythm, the, the breathing, the growing and the twisting lead to what I've been doing. It's called, uh, my, my book is called Circles Sacred with the, two S's in the middle, and it's honoring, uh, well, literally the sacred feminine. So we're gonna go to the, the seafoam green, which is the cover of my website. And I wanna thank Kaylee Costello, who's a brilliant uh, graphic designer at Kendall, there it is. Um, who does all my production work for me so that it allows me to draw and I don't have to s sit down and figure out how to use the computer especially, which is kind of funny in this day and age, but you know, that's my choice, to be an artist and get somebody to do the work for me. So this this is, uh, um, this kind of repeats myself itself. My, my daughter Devin's here tonight and she found this model in the first place and 
Uh, you can see it here a number of years later. Here you can see it's made of different objects, scorpion shells and rocks at the base of, of, of this twisting tree sculpture, which is really just a figure dancing. Um, and then you can see how it's manipulated here. Now, this isn't a sales pitch because I'm not selling these. I'm not giving them away. <laughs> this is a first one off of production. Uh, but it, it, it's, uh, it is what I do. I, th I take ideas, I make them into stories, and, and this is what happens here. So it takes three books to make one book. Um, anyways, I'm going to go to, um, yeah, I think you need to go forward two, and then I'll decide whether which order I want to talk in, and then I'll, I'll pass the microphone here. Um, this, unfortunately, got cropped a little bit, so it's a, it's a dress, but there's no body in it. So you kind of just take it literally as what you see. Obviously, it goes through its layers of reality and symbolism. Um, the red blood bleeding from her heart is dry red blood. So it's, it's been a long, su sustained type of bleeding. Uh, the nest below is fairly abstract, but there's no egg in it, and there's this twisting ancient petroglyphic uh, uh, symbol of... Uh, the creative movement of the spiraling of the universe. Um, okay, I want to go to my little story I'm going to tell, and then I, I'll turn this over to Megan. Um, I need to go. You need to go all the way around. There we go. Okay. Um, this is the first uh, image in my book. My book has an infrastructure which allows me to work uh, with this infrastructure the rest of my life. Uh, 11 images, 11 images, 11 images, then three books make one book. It sounds a little technical, but it's easy to understand. So there's this cyclical, cyclical movement, time, timing. We all are concerned about timing in life, uh, duration. In they all have components here. Uh, this is uh, the chapter called Energy Field, and this is called Keep Moving. And my, uh, <clears throat> my mother uh, lived 25 years longer than my father, uh, <clears throat> to 90. She had a little th handwritten three by five card on the refrigerator, it said keep moving. Now, both my parents were born in poverty. Hundred, go back 100 years ago, okay? Let's play this out and I don't need to say anything else. My, my mother graduated from high school with a 4.0 average. <clears throat> she was president of the Thesium, Thespians, president, our editor of the uh, yearbook. Um, what else was she? She's president of her class, and it, she was a little leprechaun and played uh, field hockey. Uh, she was the first woman admitted to uh, what would be, I in the ensuing months, Wayne State University. Once again, I want to reiterate, com lived in complete poverty. Her mother died at 11. She raised her younger brothers. <coughs> and she won a full scholarship to Wayne State University. This is what her father said. You cannot go to college because you are not a man. Okay. Um, I feel like I need like to l let that rest for a moment. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you to the two other artists here and for GRCC for putting this on. Um, my name's Megan. Uh, the best way that I know to um, talk about my work is to just kind of bring you really quickly through my thought process over the past couple of years. So um, I'm going to kind of take you on a speeding train through my <laughs> thought process over the course of a few um, years of work. Um, my background is predominantly in plein air painting, so painting outside from life. Um, that's where I started and the thing that I originally got really passionate about. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I had the opportunity to work with a couple of artists in the south of France uh, who had a 
very particular way of art making and was something that I got really attached to. Um, this particular group of artists treated painting from life and particularly painting outside as a sort of contemplative um, meditative ritual uh, and one that they believed could lead to a certain uh, sort a certain sort of transcendence I suppose um, that's a pretty heavy burden to place on any painting when you start it that this is going to be your moment of transcendence and your you know, moment to really experience pure objective reality. Uh, but that was something that they really truly believed was possible. And that was something that I found really inspiring uh, and has kind of continued as a, a thread throughout my work. Um, so the thing that I really took away from that experience and the thing that has remained constant is this idea of art as, as being a ritual process and a ritual process of interacting with a particular environment. Um, instead of starting a painting and working, uh, sort of starting with an, uh, an idea and working on continuing to resolve an image, I, uh, the meaning in the work is coming not so much from that direction of process, but more from uh, this sort of continued, uh, repeated interaction with a particular environment, this continued painting of, of sort of the same scenes and themes over and over and over again. Um, so I do still do quite a bit of plein air painting. Um, the, this image, and then if you want to show the next one, are two sort of just smaller studies that have come out of that. So I wanted to show them as kind of an opening. Um, one of the things that I've been doing really recently uh, over the past year or so is to paint the things directly outside of my living room windows where I have my studio. Um, ref coming back to those same spaces uh, over and over and over again, painting them through the changing of the seasons. Um, and again, just sort of addressing this idea of ritual, uh, interacting with the same space over and over, approaching it differently a little bit each time. Um, if you want to move on to the next one. To kind of go back along my time thought line, though, um, when I first came back to the US after having this sort of marvelous experience. Um, I was initially really sort of disappointed and in crisis that I didn't feel I could have this same transcendent moment that I had had frolicking in olive fields in France, surprise, surprise, uh, as I could sort of painting just in my daily grind at my home, um, painting in Grand Rapids and trying to paint downtown in urban environments because that's where I lived and that's, um, you know, what I wanted to experience was, uh, a deeper connection with my daily environment and I was having trouble sort of forcing that to happen. Um, at the same time, I was reading a lot of sort of postmodern uh, theory about the landscape, how we approach it in art um, and how we approach it uh, as sort of contemporary people um, and was gradually coming to the conclusion that it's not totally possible for me to have a completely objective, unmediated experience of the landscape. Um, that in fact, every time that I go into this space, I'm distracted by things. I'm seeing it, uh, you know, passing through my car windows and sort of half paying attention. Uh, I'm using mediation when I create my images because I'm working from photographs. Um, my vision is literally obscured by weather and by light. Um, my experience is obscured just kind of by my lack of attention, uh, driving to and from places in my car and experiencing my environment that way is a totally different experience than standing for two hours in an olive field and painting. Um, and you have a different relationship with your environment because of the way that that experience happens. Um, so I decided I wanted to just kind of be truer to how I was experiencing things in, in my life and maybe approach the problem from the opposite direction and look at what was mediating my experience of the place that I lived, um, what was actually obscuring the way that I interacted with things or blocking me from having this like pure quote unquote experience that I wanted to have. Uh, so what I wound up with was a bunch of very sort of foggy, cloudy looking cityscapes based on um, imagery from Grand Rapids from a very limited range, um, just right around my home and my work. Um, if you wanna flip to the next image. 
um, some of which became more abstract than others. One of the really nice things that came out of this process of working uh, was I would start with this really strict geometric drawing, um, really strictly drawn architecture, and then go through this process over the course of weeks or months, burying and destroying that original image. Um, so instead of starting with a rough sketch and, and working toward refinement, I was kind of going in completely the opposite direction. Um, so I was thinking a lot about um, how, how my experience was getting mediated, how I was being blocked um, from sort of having this oneness or this relationship with the, the outer, my exterior world. And at the same time, I was sort of taking these drawings, this original clarity that I had started with and, and actually physically blocking that original image, um, making revisions, uh, covering over the top of things and almost sort of physically distancing myself from the imagery that I had started with. Uh, and that's something that's continued to be a theme throughout um, the work that I've been doing the past couple of years. Um, do you want to flip to the next one, I guess? So the painting that I have in Art Prize in particular um, and the work that I've been doing more recently uh, sort of relates to some of the stuff that I've been doing before, um, but also comes out of a trip that I took uh, about a year ago to um, the UP, to the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, I've always been pretty interested in Michigan history, and while I was there, I had the chance to take an extremely unofficial tour of some abandoned mining settlements. Um, <laughs> so uh, the thing that struck me as we were kind of walking through this space out in the middle of nowhere, um, it looks like a regular woods, and then you would kind of walk up on these rectangular stone pits in the ground, and you were actually kind of walking up at ceil on ceiling level um, with some of these old mining settlements. Uh, and I just became completely fascinated with these rectangular pits <laughs> in the ground, and I'm obsessed with them. Um, it seemed to have such a relationship to what I had been doing in practice, which was uh, starting with this clean, clear geometry and then going through this process of layering the sediment of paint on top of it, um, adding all of this sort of erosion <laughs> onto the top of my image via paint. And the same thing had sort of been happening to this particular landscape. Um, I guess the next two you can kind of flip through, give a little time to look at each. So I, I did a bunch of paintings of that um, particular rectangular pit shape. And then also a uh, number of paintings of just of the architecture up in that area. Um, Calumet was one of the places that I spent a little bit of time in um, and was really interested in some of the architecture there, which comes all out of this red, beautiful quarried stone. Um, again, from the mining copper boom of the area. Um, and I guess I kind of became infatuated with this idea, too, of, uh, of a boom as this sort of collective moment of, of epiphany, um, having a clear relationship to uh, the place that you live, um, having kind of a clear collective consciousness about what, what the priority was for that area, even though um, mining maybe isn't always the best thing uh, for that. But uh, And then being able to see this place as, as sort of almost a, a ghost town um, or a, a vestige, I guess, of, of it was when it was um, a major boom area. Uh, ha had to, related to me, I guess, in, in sort of a poetic way to this idea of, of starting, starting with clarity, starting with a desire for um, an epiphany, a desire for a really clear, clean cut relationship, and then adding more and more abstraction and more and more distance um, between uh, that original experience and, and sort of the reality of that situation. Uh, so the last painting on here, my art prize painting, comes kind of out of that body of work. Um, so uh, this is a big overlook view of actually just some sort of parking lots and retail areas in Houghton, Michigan, um, up there in the Keweenaw Peninsula. And uh, this painting took 
particularly long to make, longer than they usually do. Um, again, because I started with this sort of clean, nice architectural drawing, uh, and then spent just more time than usual, I guess, sort of destroying it and layering over top of it. Um, the more I kept going, the more that I felt I really needed to just bury this original image. Uh, and the more that that happens, the more that the texture builds up in the painting, um, the more that I have an ability to kind of scrape back, um, sand things even, work with some of the layers that come out of just this ritual process of adding paint, this ritual process of readdressing this same surface. Um, and eventually I chose with this one to um, pull back some of that imagery that I had been working with from these pit paintings um, and sort of add this rectangular crevice pit shape um, in on top of the final image. Again, just thinking a lot about um, that particular area and its history, uh, the scars that have been left on that particular landscape, uh, how people's relationships have changed with that environment. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of where that painting came out of and sort of the trajectory that I've been headed in more recently. So I guess I will pass the microphone on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for coming tonight and for supporting the arts. I feel like I'm completing a full circle because my experience in Grand Rapids started at Rant Ransom Street, and uh, which included attending a lot of shows and performances in this auditorium. And um, let me begin by describing my style and influence as a painter. Um, as I hope you've noticed from my art prize entry, um, I'm a figurative artist and um, I describe my style as expressive realism. Um, and I prefer the, the creative touch um, of an artist that, that we bring to the drawing, to the composition, and um, with paint application. Um, my artistic influences are painters like uh, Lucian Freud and uh, Marc Chagall. Uh, let's see. I strive to be uh, Rembrandt-esque in my colors and my composition. And um, I also love uh, Renaissance art and uh, mural artists and portrait artists like uh, Leonardo, Michelangelo, uh, mural painters like Francesco della Francesca. And I also, oh, I also love artists um, um, such as Goya and Dali, who influence their art with realism, um, but also have symbols and subtext in their art. Uh, I was recently interviewed for an article, and I like to begin by asking myself a question, why do I <coughs> create historical-based art and um, art based on narrative and historical and contemporary events? And um, I create um, art that's based on my life, um, and by doing so, I connect to others and I communicate to people where I come from, <laughs> and um, uh, and also because to me, art making is personal and intimate, and um, I reveal when I create art, I reveal um, to the viewer about myself and also to myself. And so, um, anyways, uh, one of the, just a little bit about myself, I, woo, <laughs> sorry. So, I went to Kendall College of Art and Design for my undergraduate and for my master's degree. And um, as Nick Antonakis mentioned, I was born in Moscow, Russia, and then I relocated to Lansing in 1992, to Lansing, Michigan. And this event has influenced my my art and my worldview significantly. And, um, oh, I should probably mention the art prize. The, the three paintings in the Collins Gallery are, is the new, the, it's a new body of my work. And it's a story, a personal story of um, exile. Because the art is about uh, Armenian genocide of 1915. And naturally, I wasn't around to um, to survive the Armenian, the genocide of Armenians in Turkey, um, 
but I was unfortunate to experience the return of the same event in 1989. And um, you see, in the late 80s, um, uh, the Soviet regime was collapsing and uh, nationalism and religious intolerance began to rear its ugly head. And uh, with the Soviet implosion, um, it resulted in, in the massacres in Azerbaijan, the three-way war in former Republic of Yugoslavia and Chechnyan conflict. And, and uh, those are the events that moved me and my family to this country. Um, so um, when I um, lived in when I lived in Moscow, I thought it was uh, really fun to have my apartment crammed with uh, relatives and friends, and little did I know that they were running for their lives. And so the three paintings in the in the gallery uh, begin with a um, the seraph painting, and it um, it's actually I read this. Um, uh, it was a short story in a novel um, titled Raise the Euphrates um, by Carol Edgarian. And uh, part of the story um, was about events in 1915 witnessed by the survival, um, survivor who happened to be the, uh, the author's grandmother. And she, um, what she mentioned was um, the Turkish soldiers were beheading the Armenian girls and then they were tying their braids together and um, hanging their heads um, around the streets in this horrible garland. And in, in my painting, um, I wanted to canonize um, these girls and th that's why they are these seraphs and they're forever connected at the braid. Um, and the next painting is the Weaver of Memory. Um, so she is, um, Imagine that, so I imagine that the girl who witnessed um, uh, decided to narrate the story in the form of carpet weaving. And if you look closer at the designs of, on the painting of, on the carpet, um, you'll see uh, the horrible events of the genocide. And she's looking over her shoulder as if someone is knocking at the door, someone's breaking the door down and um, then in the next painting, she is laying on like uh, an oriental rug, uh, an Armenian rug, and she is um, slain in that painting. And I'm, I was trying to capture the, the moment that her soul was leaving her body. Um, uh, so that was, that's the works in the Collins Gallery. And occasionally when conversing about Armenian genocide, I often do, um, get phrases like, uh, why don't you get over it? You know, it's been so long ago, move on, and why don't you liberate yourself? Uh, I'm sorry, can we stop these slides? Because I was just about to talk for the previous body of work. So, so that's what people, sometimes I'm surprised when people say these things to myself, and um, I respond by giving them the famous quote, a genocide forgotten is a genocide repeated, and that is one of the reasons um, events like Armenian genocide is reoccurring in country in places like Darfur, Rwanda, and most recently in Syria um, is because the lessons over past are overlooked and forgotten. Um, so, and so let me just tell you a little bit my previous artwork. This is not um, my first attempt at representing hardship and strife. Um, my undergraduate um, body of work uh, in the last semester, uh, I started to uh, create a body of work for um, immigration. And um, in this particular painting called Manhattan Backwash, um, every time people travel somewhere, they take their livestock, their pets, like cats and dogs, and then there are the unwanted uh, creatures that sneak in and unwelcomed. Uh, and so that's why I'm holding lovingly uh, this rat, even though I'm not a fan of rodents, I um, I sympathize with the unwanted guest, and and that's why I'm also um, kind of cradling because uh, in a way I'm representing how I cherish my culture. And uh, in the next uh, slide uh, is a diptych, and uh, it's a two-part painting. I am the model of these. Um, it's 
in a way, it's a self-portrait. And um, this one's called Culture Bound. And uh, the next painting is called Looking West. And um, this represents, uh, the first one represents, like, I'm cocooned, but I'm also in a barren landscape. And there's really nothing there for me. Even though I'm happy, there's nothing but cold and suffocation. And in this painting, um, I am liberating myself and I'm overcoming the changes. But um, also, I wanted to say that it has very moody uh, background, industrial uh, landscape. So you really don't know what's going to happen to uh, this person. But I'm overcoming, and I'm going to you know, strive to work harder. Um, in the next uh, painting, curious. Oh, OK. It's um, one of the most unusual uh, bodies of uh, works I did, because these are passport photos that I enlarged. Um, I um, uh, like somehow on Photoshop, someone helped me, and I didn't lose any of the pixels. So then I sealed the, the reproduction, you know, the photographs with artist medium, and I created a vintage effect, and I painted um, a flock of uh, whooping cranes, uh, birds of uh, long distance flight. And, um, and that, I think, concluded my immigration series about myself. And in the next uh, works, I believe um, I moved on to other cultures uh, that have similar experiences. And I did a series of these bird holders. I was hoping, do you guys have those images with you? Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's a, like a close-up of the birds. And uh, so just as um, they're holding uh, birds, it's about holding on, letting go. Some of these paintings had like a, they were holding tropical birds a little too closely. Some of them were holding like uh, roosters and like these, you know, country folk birds. And in the next one, um, he is letting go of the, maybe like personal baggage, maybe, um, Spirit, um, and that I believe concluded my immigration series. And yet the work spilled in, in, into um, just kind of trying to remember what what came next. Um, I believe my water series, and uh, no pun intended, the work has spilled into the next body of work because um, this painting was titled uh, "Venus in Exile," and it was you know. It's feminine, and but also um, the root of, I believe, all these paintings. And if you, I, I'm trying to think, can you go to the next one? Um, right, it's about, um, you know, whether uh, she's happy or in distress, it's about not knowing where you're going and also uh, personal turmoil. And uh, this one's called Koi. It wasn't very... Well titled, but I really love this painting. And then the next piece, I believe, is the um, uh, Beloved. And again, the eels are silently screaming by. And in the next one, um, and that was my final work. Um, this painting is about Katrina, because when it happened, it evoked memories in me that um, I felt very connected to the people that went through uh, that event because people escape without things that are most available to them, like their m pictures, um, their childhood memories, um, tokens from their past that they had to leave behind, like I did. And, um, um, and in the way, I felt like society was betraying the people, and they were left stranded and unprotected. And um, so I responded very strongly to Katrina. And um, I titled this painting, Abduction of New Orleans. And it's a mythological reference to abduction of Europe. Um, and the girl represents New Orleans. Uh, you know, that's why she's smiling slightly and kind of happy, kind of easygoing. But yet, she is still carried away um, on, the, on the back of the beast. And in um, the next piece is the final painting, um, also part of the, the genocide work. I'll just title it that. Um, 
uh, it's, this one's, I'm having difficulty describing this one because, um, and I hope to do more works like this in the future, where if you look at the background, you've got Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, and then you have the Wailing Wall of uh, Jerusalem, um, and in the way he's like uh, skewering meat, so he's getting ready for um, shish kebabing and something that I believe every culture does, but you're not really sure whether uh, this model is, is he violent, is he, is he heroic, um, what, you know, is he Armenian, is he Arabic, and the fire, something that's present to represent the, um, the I would suppose the problems between the East and the West. And um, in the near future, I will be creating a body of work dedicated to Armenian genocide and hopefully to display in, 19, in 2015, excuse me, uh, which will mark the 100 year milestone of the events. Thank you. Thank you, Alina and Megan and Diana. Um, I'm learning a lot tonight. Uh, I've enjoyed it very much. Um, I would like to open this uh, to our uh, audience for uh, questions tonight, uh, see if there are any questions that they'd like to ask. I have one in mind, too. So as they're thinking, I might ask mine first. So if you can come up with something, I would love for you to share your question. Uh, the thing that came to mind before I saw um, your presentation tonight um, was related to Art Prize, and I was thinking as you were presenting about all of your influences, the learning uh, that we all um, experience through the path of life, um, uh, through, through relationships, studies in graduate school, undergrad, and so on, things that you mentioned. Um, Art Prize is going on around us. I'm just wondering if you've had time to reflect over the last couple of years of what type of learning you're experiencing through our prize, and if you'd like to respond to it, any one of you as artists. It's okay. Well, we got more than one, so that works. <laughs> um, I, I was overwhelmed with the, the whole idea of our prize. Um, I was in Mexico this first summer that it appeared, so I wasn't on the radar to participate, but I've managed to find a good a venue for the last four years. Um, you know, I do what I do. And um, I walk around and I'm in awe of, of what I see. It's, uh, it's, it's just astounding. Um, I rush home, I'm inspired, I can't sleep. Um, I started my uh, my sculpture this year, which is the first time I submitted a sculpture rather than a drawing, um, during Art Prize last year. You know, already, just with a couple days, uh, four and a half hours with Caitlin and another four hours the day before we parked ourselves down here tonight. Uh, um, you know, things are, are, are rocking and rolling, so to speak. Um, I'm looking for those those deeper levels, and I, I'm touched by the just the enormity of this idea, the um, the unbelievable skill of, of of I guess they're my peers, aren't they? They're they're just uh, amazing. Um, it's humbling, it's inspiring, and it creates more sleepless nights. But that's uh, that's the way I'm wired. Anybody else want to? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I guess I tend to agree. Just that the sheer amount of of stuff <laughs> and exposure to things that um, that I haven't seen before, that I wouldn't necessarily have considered before as contemporary art or maybe of that category, has been really like stretching for me. Um, I had a really good debate with somebody last uh, art prize about a piece that involved like a whole bunch of taxidermy wolves. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? There was, then they were attacking, and um, I had a really lengthy debate with somebody about whether or not this was a, a work of contemporary art or whether it was just really good taxidermy. Um, <laughs> and I, I wound up falling under the category that, uh, that yeah, I think it could be a contemporary art, that it was beautifully done, that it, there was 
fantastic movement, um, that it moved me. Uh, and so some of these things that I wouldn't necessarily, um, as somebody who's, I've just finished sort of my academic stretch, I just finished my master's um, about a little less than a year ago. Uh, it might not have been something in that context that I would have put under that category, but instead that category just keeps getting stretched and stretched, and my definition of art has definitely been stretched by our prize. So that's that's been a wonderful thing. Thank you. Alina, do you have a response, or yeah. would you like to wait for questions? Sure. Um, no, it's just... I was just going to say this is my first art prize, and uh, because unfortunately, when art prize began, I moved to New York, and I recently relocated back to to Lansing, Michigan. So, <laughs> and um, it's actually very similar to what I've seen out uh, on East Coast, where again there is a lot of performances and installations, and make you question um, art or some of these theories. So, exactly. Thank you. Is there anyone who has a question that is general or specific to one of the artists? We have the mic here, so anyone? <laughs> All right, then. I think we're ready to close the... Oh, we do have one. Did you hear that one? Frustration. <laughs> <laughs> Sleepless nights. <laughs> Sleepless <laughs> nights, yeah, like Mayana mentioned. Um, it's never perfect, the end result is never perfect, so you you just keep beating your head against the wall trying to make it be, I guess. That process of, of, of just trying to get something right over and over again and occasionally having those rewarding moments when you make a painting that works and it's, you know, the angels sing and <laughs> you you know, you work toward those moments. You, you asked what drives us as an artist. Is that is did I got the question right? Yeah. Basically, um, well, I, th I think what I said is really clear. What drives me? Um, it, it's um, it's something that happened to to my mother, that that deeply transformed me for my entire life, and. Um, it made me encounter what I call entitled suffering, where somebody can, I, I do think about genocide. You know, I, I think about genocide beginning with Caesar in the Western world. I, I think about that suffering. I think about it in the family, in the community. I, th I think about it uh, being severed from conscience and, and guilt, and then, I find people who suffer feel they're entitled to the suffering, and I find this incredibly threatening and sickening. Therefore, as I go through my infrastructure, I, I deal with unrequited love, which was the, the dress drawing with the, the body, and I go to, as it unfolds, to universal love. That, that wonderful word that we often use as artists, it's almost outmoded today. Well, what, what, what motivates me? Beauty is empathy. Beauty is empathy. It's that simple. I feel, I respond, I express. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. We have one up front? No? All right. I think... Uh, We'll bring this to a close. A big hand for the artists. Thank you so much.